Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series, the podcast that celebrates individuals and families, businesses, and organizations that seek out and promote the exploration, stewardship, conservation, access, and enjoyment of the outdoors. Greg Peterson is our guest today. Greg, otherwise known as Farmer Greg, is a food system educator and the creator and chief visionary of the Urban Farm, and he is the host of the Urban Farm Podcast. Greg, it's a pleasure to have you on the Outdoor Adventure Series. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to chat. Excellent. I love chatting with other podcasters because I know that you know what it takes to put one of these things together. Oh, yes. <laughs> that is the case. A lot of people get into it and not realizing what they're getting into. And then like uh, three, four or five episodes later, it's like, okay, I'm done. Uh, but, but you have been at the podcasting for quite a while. So I want to talk about that in a little bit, but I would love first off to know for our listeners, I have a nice background uh, with my logo on it. And I pulled this off of my favorite site, Canva. But Greg, is, and you'll see this on our video, it's got this beautiful background. Greg, tell me that's real. It is real. It's my front yard looking out my front door. That was last July. So those are gladiolas all blooming out. And uh, yeah, we're loving it. We, My partner Heidi and I moved here from Phoenix, Arizona after living our entire lives in Phoenix. Oh. We were looking for someplace quiet or to be than 4.7 million people. And we settled on Asheville, North Carolina, and we found four acres uh, about 18 minutes from downtown Asheville, which that was a little bit mind blowing to me that we could be so close yet so rural. And uh, we have been working the past two years on transforming this space into a farm. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Now, I love the the topic of regenerative farming. And again, for our listeners, I met Greg uh, through a, a, a podcast hosting service or guest service called Podmatch. And every once in a while, I, I hit a bullseye and I think Greg is that bullseye for today. But I love this topic of regenerative farming because as a member of the Outdoor Writers Association of America, I interview a lot of folks who are outdoor enthusiasts. They, they're hunters, they're birders, they're, they're hikers, and they come across a lot of farmland. They traverse a lot of farmland. And you can't go anywhere in the U.S. today into a grocery store and not question what's on the, the back of the package in the ingredient list. But I know from these conversations with my colleagues is there are folks out there now like yourself who are very much into putting the, 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 the nutrients and keeping the nutrients in the land. So I'd love if you could share for our listeners benefit a little bit about your background and what is regenerative farming? Why is it so important? Wow. All right. So. Let's travel back to 1975. I was in the eighth grade, what, about 14, 15 years old. And I wrote a paper on how we were overfishing the oceans. Okay. To this day, I have no idea where that idea came from. I just knew that there was something deeply wrong with how we were living on the planet. And fast forward to 1981, so I was 20 at the time. And I was on the board of the Arizona Aquaculture Association, Aquaculture's Fish Farming. Mm -hmm. And we were visiting a farm in Southern Arizona. And they, it was a farm where they just raised fish. And they were harvesting these fish and processing the fish. And when you process a fish, you get about 30% meat and you get about 70% everything else that was left over. And they were throwing that away. Mm. And it just made no sense to me why they were taking this resource and, and just throwing it. They were actually giving it to the wildlife in there. They were just dumping it out back and the coyotes and other animals were coming and eating. 
eating it. And so that was making a, a significant negative impact on the wildlife as well. And so I just, for the next three or four years, I just kind of pondered that and looked to see what it would take to make a farm, to build a farm, to start a farm that there was no waste on. Mm. And in that three or four year period, I actually designed on paper what we would now call a regenerative farm. And what that means is that you have a farm where there is no waste. Everything gets used just like it happens in nature. Mm -hmm. And fast forward to 1991, I'm 30 at the time, and I'm standing at the mailbox one day, I pulled the mail out of the mailbox, and there's this flyer, this is prior to the internet now, there's this flyer on permaculture. And I was reading it, and I remember running in, and I was married at the time, and I ran in and I said, hey, Michelle, I don't know where this flyer came from. I'm going to do this course. Would you do it with me? And and so I dove in and became, and I came to a place where I understood what permaculture is and how regenerative fits in. Permaculture, I like to call the art and science of working with nature. How do we work in the flow of nature rather than against nature? And we human beings, we think we know how to do it better than nature. And yeah. I got news for you. That's a joke. Yes. Nature will always bat last. So there's very specific regenerative farm concepts. And here, I'm going to boil it down for you. Human beings create systems that are degenerative. Mm -hmm. Every single system that humans have put in place on the planet in thousands of years breaks down over time. Mm -hmm. The headset you're wearing, the desk we're sitting at, the chairs, the roads, the bridges, the pipelines, it all requires constant work to make sure that they stay uh, operable. And that is, those are degenerative systems. And I would love to hear from your listeners if they come up with something that's actually regenerative that humans have created. So degenerative, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end in the process. Which, if you think about it for a moment, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. If every human system that we've ever created, there's an end to, that's a problem regenerative systems are circular systems. They're circular, and this is how nature works. And one of the key components of a regenerative system is there's no waste. And when we're designing regenerative farming, we take it a lot further than the simple thing that I just shared with you, but what we're doing in regenerative farming is we're only using nature-based natural products in order to move our system forward. And that can, so in my backyard, I had what I called my regenerative composting system when I lived in Phoenix. And it looks like this. So I'll, I'll really, I'll boil it down. This is how it works. You have food scraps from the kitchen. You make food. There's a little bowl on the, on the, kitchen counter and what do you do with them often people throw them away wherever away is and what i would do with them at the urban farm is they would go to one of four places they would go to the chickens they would go to the black soldier fly larvae which was food for the chickens they would go to the worm bin which made soil for our gardens or the compost pile. So I had all those systems set up at the urban farm in Phoenix when I lived there so that I was taking the food waste, putting it back into the natural system in the form of one of those four things that would then go into the soil because all of those, the chickens and the black soldier flies and the worms make healthier soil from their 
poop, essentially. And the compost and all that stuff would go back into the gardens to raise more food that we would then bring into the kitchen. We would eat what we ate. The scraps left over started the whole process again. So you can see that's a circular right. system there. And that's how nature works is with circular systems. So that's that's the short story, interestingly enough, about my adventure for the first 35 years of my life. I, I love it. And I, I love the education, the, the permaculture, regenerative systems or in degenerative systems. And, and I think you're spot on about we, we create oftentimes, oftentimes not very well using products of a variety of type that we have no idea the effect it's going to have on nature. And we, we're very much not consumers or are aware of systems theory and how one system affects another. So I love this aspect that regenerative systems is it, is circular. How, when you had this epiphany way back when you were a kid mm -hmm. in the overfishing, how did you take this epiphany and turn that into you know, an educate was it an edu education, a degree, a, a side hustle? How did you, where'd you end up that all of a sudden you have this business, the urban farm? Uh, that's a great question. Um, or, so I had a paper out when I was nine. And no, you and one, I are the same age, by the way, within, let's just say within a year or two, because I recognize yeah. the word paper out. Yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. Right. So I had a paper out, and the main reason I had a paper out is because I wanted a fish aquarium. And I was interested in getting a fish aquarium and raising fish to eat. And so that, that kind of started the process. And as I kind of transitioned through that, one of the things that I did when I was 15 years old is I used to hang out at the fish store at the local fish store. And Bill was one of the guys that worked there. And I, I would just show up after school. I was 15 years old. I rode my bike there and I'd show up and help him bag fish for customers and just do all kinds of stuff. And one day he said to me, Greg, how would you like to help me clean a fish pond on Sunday? 15 years old mucking out a fish pond i'm in yeah and when and i think he paid me five or ten bucks or something like that and when we got done he said to me greg i don't want to do these anymore how about if you take them over so at the age of 15 i was gifted a small fish pond business so i started cleaning fish ponds and over the course of the next eight years i built multiple aquaculture ponds for people in their backyards that they were actually raising fish right to eat I actually converted a swimming pool into a fish pond the guy used to do yearly um, catfish fries with a fish that he grew in his swimming pool oh wow and uh, then 1984 happened and i let my dad convince me to go out and get a real job and that lasted 11 months i got fired and during that same most of the jobs I've ever had, I've gotten fired from. I'm a religious entrepreneur. There you go. JOBs just don't cut it. Right, exactly. And during that 11 months, I that was when the Macintosh computer came out. Mm -hmm. And I was I had a buddy who I was living with, and he was selling Macintosh computers. So during during the day. Uh, I would just play on his Macintosh computer. And in 1985 and 86, I started my first two technology companies, essentially. In 1987, I started a software company that lasted 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so for about 10 or 12 years, I was working in technology and I was miserable. Mm -hmm. It's like, this ain't it. This is pushing it up forward a thought system that I don't believe in marketing stuff. I was working in marketing and marketing software and that kind of stuff. And it's just, that it didn't work for me. 
And in 1999, I went back to college. I got my degree, my first degree and my second degree in 2004. And as part of one of my classes that I took in like 2000, 2001, I had to write a mission for my life. And what I realized, so at that point in 19, in 2003, uh, 2002, I'd been living at the urban farm for about 15 years. And I had been implementing permaculture pra practices on this lot product on this property for about 15 years. And in that class, I realized that what I really wanted to do was show it off. I wanted to teach people how to do their own edible landscapes because that's what we do in permaculture. And so back then in 2002, the urban farm was born. The urban farm was my house. I lived at it for 32 years when I lived in Phoenix. It was a property that was 80 feet wide and 160 feet deep. It included chickens, composting worms, solar panels, gray water and rainwater harvesting, 80 fir trees, an entirely edible landscape that what we now call an old growth food forest, right? where there was always something to eat in the yard every day. And about the early aughts, I got urbanfarm.org and I started talking to people about it and sharing what I was up to. And over the 20 years that I did tours at the urban farm, we had, I don't know, 20, 30, 40,000 people come through over that 20 year period on, on tour day, we would easily get a hundred to 200 people show up to see this normal looking. In fact, if you walked by it on the street, unless you knew exactly what you were looking for, it looked like every other house on the street. That was the cool thing. So that's how I got to urban farming. Very cool. As you were sharing the story, I was envisioning, oh God, I wonder if this guy had tours coming into his house and, and there you go. And I, I wonder how many epiphanies occurred, insights occurred from some other little kid or teacher or parent going through yeah. that house and saying, we need to do that. I need to do that. Mom, dad, we need to do this. Endless stories. So many. I, I launched a program in like 2007, 2008 called 10,000 Urban Farms in Phoenix. Mm. And what I, what I encourage people to do is you can be an urban farmer and you can be an urban farmer and you can be an urban farmer and you can be a rural farmer. And here's the, it, it's really simple. Grow food and share it. I don't care right. if you're selling it, but if you're growing food with the intent to share it, that's a different mindset than gardening. And then the third thing to do is name your farm. Mm. When I named the urban farm in 2002, it took on a life of its own. Right. To this day in Phoenix, the urban farm is a known place. And the people that purchased it from me are continuing the legacy, which is so incredibly cool. That, that is very cool. So you've created something and now it, it's regenerative. Uh, it's it, takes on a life of its own. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I love it. I, love I just it. got chills when you said that. Okay. My pleasure. Not my <laughs> pleasure. So I, I'm curious in, in the, within the urban farm and this, the, the, the whole regenerative movement, why is it the, 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 the kind of the, the, so, I mean, the soil to me is key. I mean, you can't without healthy, nutritive soil yeah. things are not going to grow right and so you've got your your bins the composting the worms the the other two uh bins why is that so important and what can we as i mean i'm a renter in a house my my roommate has this magnificent oasis in the backyard it's where mm -hmm. i have my morning coffee and i just enjoy the the, nice. the flowers, the smells, the birds that come by. Yeah. Well, why is that soil so key to the success of the regenerative farming? Well, the, the, really, the bottom line is soil is everything. 
And there's five components of healthy soil. And most likely, if you're if you have a any dirt at all around your property, it's dirt. Mm -hmm. In fact, just as a side note, if somebody is selling you topsoil, it's dirt. And while dirt's not a bad thing, if all you have is dirt, you're not going to be very successful. Dirt is broken round, broken down rock. It's highly compacted. The water can't get in. It's easy to fix broken dirt. But if that's all you have, good luck. Mm. The five components of healthy soil. It's super simple. Dirt, airspace, water, organic matter, and everything that's alive in the soil. And the key piece here that you don't have a lot to say about is everything that's alive in the soil. The key piece here that you have a lot to say about is adding organic matter. Mm -hmm. The organic matter is the, with a capital T, solution to fixing broken dirt. And so dirt, airspace, water, organic matter, and everything that's alive in the soil. When you add organic matter to your soil, whether it's in the form of compost, planting mix, um, healthy, healthy soil, when you add it, it over time, it creates airspace, which lets the water of the moisture get in and it brings the life to the soil. I'm talking about mycorrhiza. I'm talking about microbes. I'm talking about bugs. I'm talking about worms. All of these things, when you have a healthy, balanced soil system, they're going to show up. And there's people talk about bad bugs. In fact, I can't tell you how many people email me and say, oh, my gosh, I got mushrooms growing in my yard or there's ants in my garden or or or. And. My first question is, what's wrong with that? Right. Secondly, if you're growing mushrooms, you're doing something really right. Right. Yeah. Because that's the mycorrhiza. Mm -hmm. uh, ants are diggers. They're helping aerate the soil. Aeration, yeah. Right. They're pollinators. I just, I just saw a post on Facebook this morning. This guy said, how do I get rid of this weed? I don't want to spray it with Roundup. Well, at least he was conscious enough to spray it, not spray it with Roundup. But I said to him, what's wrong with the weed? And his response was, well, it attracts ants. And I didn't go any farther with him, but my next question is, well, what's wrong with ants? It's nature. Right. It's nature taking care of itself. It's that circular system like the forest in back of me. What happens in a forest is leaves fall, branches fall, deer come along, leave a deposit behind, ants do their digging, gophers dig. And all of this is about aerating soil, adding organic matter to soil. And before long in the forest, you have this really nice, healthy soil. And what we do as human beings, and I'm not passionate here, what we do as human beings is we rake up those leaves and we throw them away, wherever away is. And what we don't know is the nutrient level in those leaves that you're raking up and throwing away. When it wow. could, when the best kind of compost that you can add to your garden is leaf mold compost so i hope i answered your question <laughs> I, I think you did and then some and again i well there, there's an inner dialogue going on as i'm listening to you and i'm thinking one i need to get my roommate to go out to the the local uh store big box uh -huh. store go get a couple bins and let's get this going because i don't think she's ever put soil into the beds where these flowers are growing which mm -hmm. And I know I'm the guy that rakes up the, uh, there's two kinds of trees in our, they're in the neighbor's backyard, which they don't water at all, which is a whole other issue. But when those blossom, all of the, the little things that come off of the tree, I get to rake them up, which I like, cause I like using the blower, you know, right. it's my, my sense of order, but I'm thinking, you know, and I'm thinking here in Las Vegas, and it's not that much different than, say, Phoenix, right? right? Desert, that there is a way to make her garden even healthier than if she was, because she and her boyfriend did 
bring in the big bags of topsoil. Uh -huh. So I'm actually thinking we could have done things a lot more regeneratively. So I'm going to have to, I would have forced her to listen to this episode. Great. Well, in the meantime, all that stuff you're blowing and raking up, all those leaves and flowers and stuff, put it in the garden beds. Yeah. It'll break down and make healthy soil over time. Even the long, thin, there's, I, I forget what trees they are, but they're like long, thin leaves. Yeah. But it's, okay. I love it. It's all organic you, matter. I, I love it. And what is the benefit of, and I think I know part of the answer of, of really setting out to have this garden in here in Vegas in the desert that I can grow food, mm -hmm. whether it's an orange tree. I know there's um that there's a one of our friends has a Myers lemon tree in the backyard, which I think yep. is absolutely wonderful. But I would even love to see some chickens because I love eggs, fresh eggs, like fresh eggs that eat bugs rather than uh, whatever Roundup is or whatever those things are um how does that growing food regeneratively especially if we can do it local how mm -hmm. does that affect our, our health versus again going mm -hmm. to the grocery store looking at the package and seeing all the bad things <laughs> that are in that are that are being uh produced using ingredients that i can't even pronounce yeah well first of all let's talk about that part of it there is an app out there called Yuka, Y-U-K-A. I recently found it and it's a, a scanner. It goes on your smartphone and it scans the label and tells you, it gives you a grade for the food that you're looking at. And one of the worst things that you can eat is highly processed foods. Oh, yes. Highly processed foods have chemicals in them. Mm -hmm. They're often... Uh, cooked at high temperatures, which does all kinds of nasty things to them. So start there, go down that, download that app called Yuka and start familiarizing yourself with what's on the label. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause highly processed foods in many ways are killing us. Just the chemicals in them and. Oh yeah. This most definitely. And I mean, again, you and I are very similar age and if we're not reading labels, shame on us because yeah. we we need to. You know, nearby, about four miles away, there is a. It's called the farm, and that's where we go to get our farm, our 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 fresh eggs from. They've got nice. vegetables, and I'm actually gonna. I'm thinking just based on this episode, I need to go interview them yeah. for the podcast because this to, for them to show. A, a remote, do you do any remote podcasting, or is it pretty much in the studio? Me, it's just in the studio. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting into the remote work, and I digress with our interview, but I love doing a, a little remote work, and so that, yeah. that, that's going through my head, too. That's a perfect place to go and see what they're doing and how they're using this regenerative cycle uh, to produce good quality food and give back to the, to the environment. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Okay. Do you know the term food miles? I know food desert, but not food miles. Food miles. Food miles are the amount of miles that food travels from where it's grown to your plate. You want to take a guess at how many mile, food miles is average for the United States? I would, again, looking at labels in the, in the various chain grocery stores i would probably say 50 to 100 miles no oh, yeah i wish 1500 which means they're coming in from another country in a lot of cases a lot of cases if if it's off season for peaches and you're buying a peach it's coming from south america or australia right and the the big problem with that is that if they're harvesting a peach and they need it to travel 1,500 miles or farther, they're harvesting it before it's fully ripe. Now, there's a physiological process that goes on in the peach tree. The, the nutrient density is densest when the fruit is ripe. Mm -hmm. And as the fruit ripens on the tree, it gets more nutrient dense. So if they're pulling a peach before it's ripe 
and shipping it to you, they're pulling it and it's not fully nutrient dense yet. Here's the other problem with it is once they pull it, it starts degrading nutritionally. And then you have to spray it with something to keep it alive or, or to a certain age, to, whatever to, that means. Yeah. There, there's a ethylene spray that they spray on them to ripen them. So they right. harvest them, not ripe, and then they travel them and then so on and so on. So that peach is already not as nutrient dense as it could be. And when you, here's the thing, if you're growing a peach tree in your yard and you harvest that peach and it drops off in your hand at the perfect time and you take a bite of it and it splashes down the front of your shirt and it makes your toes tingle, you are, I can't buy peaches in the grocery store anymore. I just can't oh, do no. it. Yeah. It's, it's just ludicrous to do that because they just don't taste and the nutrients not there. So what we've done is we've created a system in this country that is providing us with food that is not nutrient dense enough. Mm. So we're not getting all the nutrients. The other part of it is in, in commercial agriculture, they've basically used up the soil. All the no nutrients, they pull it all out. And they're just, when they fertilize, they're only fertilizing it with uh, nitrogen, potassium, and NPK, and whatever the third one is. It slips my mind for the moment. And that isn't micronutrients. Remember when we talked a about dirt a little while ago? Mm -hmm. And I said, dirt has micronutrients in it, but they're not accessible if it's just dirt. Once those micronutrients are used up, if they're not replaced, or if you don't have soil life in the soil that's helping extract those micronutrients out of the dirt, our food's not as, as good for us as it could be. You know, you, you just hit on something that, that, that it was really, it was my epiphany light bulb is you know, we we want that strawberry, that peach year round because we just love strawberries mm -hmm. and peaches. Mm -hmm. But we don't realize that when we were getting it off season, it had to come from some other location, the food miles. And while we may be thinking we're eating healthy, because I have to watch the sugars that mm -hmm. I eat, uh, consume, which do my best. And but we we think we're eating healthy, but in, I think in the reality is we're really not because yeah. we're not growing locally, and we are depending on the trucks and the planes and the ships to bring in the the goods for us, and we don't have no idea also how those were grown either. Exactly, wow. and then there's the environmental impact of shipping yeah. something around the world. Yeah, yeah. So. For all those reasons, I am a uh, grow your own food aficionado. Where I ever I live next, and again, if there's space for a small home, little mini homes on your land, let me know. Now we'll we'll just need to hook up some services. I need an internet connection like you for my podcast. And there you go. go. Interesting. Um, you should interesting. You should say that when we were looking for a place, the number one thing on our list was we had to have strong internet because. I do what I do, and my partner Heidi is a yoga teacher, and she teaches yoga classes live online. So we needed that strong internet. I love it. I love it. I, I've been looking at the, the nomad lifestyle, mm -hmm. and that's like the number one. How strong is the internet, and is it stable? So I am curious uh, about the urban farm. When I was visiting your website, you have a lot of opportunities to learn going on. Can you give us kind of a 30,000 foot view when somebody goes to the urban farm and folks, we're going to share the link, but it's urbanfarm.org. Greg, when they go out to this, to the website, what are they going to find when they get there? Well, first of all, there's the podcast, okay. which lives on that. It's on my blog podcast page. You can also find that at urbanfarmpodcast.com with over 850 episodes of educational content on growing your own food. Yeah, by the way, 
I was reading a, some, a blurb, a marketing blurb today, and it's it's not something that's been lost on me. The educational benefits of podcasting Isn't amazing? Are, are just enormous. Yes. And people ask me, how oh, Howard, how many downloads do you get? It's like, I don't care. It's who consumes my podcast and, and what gonna, they do with it. What they do with it. What are you going to do with this episode and how are you going to share it? And what lives are we going to change? That's yeah, the boy, exponential growth. Boy, I have a story for you in a little while that knocked my socks off. Okay. So, which I'll share. So the podcast, we do have an education page and on, uh, we have a freebies page and an education page. And on the freebies page, you can download healthysoilhacked.com. That's my video series on how to make healthy soil. We've got one on watering your garden and so on. So there's those things. And then we have seven different courses that we that people can buy. Our Growing Food, the Basics course right now is on sale for $29 for um, nine lessons on basically starting your garden. Mm -hmm. So there's that. If you're in the Phoenix metropolitan area or the low desert or even Las Vegas for that matter, I run for the 25 years, I run a fruit tree education program. Mm -hmm. 25 years ago, I went and I went, I found out that you can go into most nurseries in every big box store and they will sell you a fruit tree that will never make fruit in the low desert. And so I started exploring that and I started teaching people how to get the proper trees for the low desert. And it's turned into a 25 year education program where we do free education all year round. And then people can pre order fruit trees from us. We sell about 4,000 fruit trees a year. Oh. So, one of my visions in 1999 was I wanted to plant 500 fruit trees in Phoenix, Arizona. That's the goal I took on. And I found a buddy of mine's house who had. Uh, two acres, and I planted out 70 fruit trees there the first year. And then my friends started asking me about it and how do I grow fruit trees in the desert? And then I started selling fruit trees because I, I needed to find a place to get them. And so 25 years later, 80,000 fruit trees, tens of thousands of people have been educated on growing fruit trees in the desert. And that's on our website as well. If you go to fruittrees.org, it takes you to uh, Urban Farm, our fruit tree page. Uh, so the, that's a bulk of it. I love it. I love it. I'm like, well, first off, I'm going to tell my uh, roommate, okay, you, you listen to my episode. You got to, you have to, but you need to go <laughs> visit this website because, you know, she's got a fruit tree out here. She does have a Myers lemon uh, tree. She's nice. got the, the garden. And I'm thinking... Okay, no more blowing of the of the the things coming from the tree. I don't know what those things are, but whatever. Uh, as long as it's I have organic my matter, man. It's all organic, man. Uh, what has been the epiphany for you, given the work that you're doing? Kind of like your aha moment. I mean, because I mean, you, you've been at this for a while, and you, with that initial epiphany way back when with fishing and uh, what's been the epiphany? Cause you're making a difference out here. Yeah. Um, 1991, I already mentioned that there's four things that actually happened in 1991. Thing number one was discovering permaculture. Mm -hmm. Thing number two was I did a seminar at landmark education. Okay. They're about breaking up the paradigm we live in. And in that, they had us create our vision for our life. And my vision that I created, that I still live fully every day, 30, 32 years later, is I'm the person on the planet responsible for transforming our global food system. Mm -hmm. That's my job every day. It's not a, it's not a burden. It's a, what gets me up in the morning. Sure. Thing number three that happened was a book. And that book was called Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. And it's a conversation between a gorilla and a man. The gorilla is the teacher. And in it, the gorilla delineates how food used to be free on the planet. 
and how over the course of the last 10,000 years, humans have locked it up. And the fourth thing that happened in 1991, this was kind of mind blowing for me is a buddy of mine was sailing in the South Pacific somewhere and they anchored in an island looking for a grocery store. And the people living on the island looked at him and said, go pick your own. <laughs> so this was like a whirlwind culmination of, oh my gosh, permaculture, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And that in that year, it, it changed my life forever. I love it. I love yeah. it. Um, one quick question. Um, I think I know what the answer is going to be, but do you have opportunities or what kinds of opportunities do you have to go to conferences and speak about this topic or topics that you're so passionate about? Well, when I was in Phoenix, a lot. Okay. Um, I Phoenix is 4.7 million people-ish. Yeah. And I did this in Phoenix really since the 1970s. I did it really loudly since 1989 when I bought my house. Right. And I, I was a big fish in a big pond in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. In Phoenix, if you're gardening at all, you know what the urban farm is. Okay. And... So I had lots of opportunities there for that. Uh, and then I moved to Asheville two years ago and the food growing systems in Phoenix are small compared to what they are here in Asheville. There's a nonprofit called ASAP here in Asheville that is all about supporting local small farms. It's a nonprofit for small farms and there are hundreds of farms in it. So when I moved here, I, uh, I had to readjust, mm -hmm. um, and I'm 63 years old and I really want to slow down. Yeah. So I'm not doing that as much anymore. I do a lot online. We do our monthly garden chats and our monthly seed chats. And so I'm doing education that way. And then I go back to Phoenix a couple of times a year for the fruit tree program. Okay. But other than that, I'm not doing a lot speaking wise right now. And that's okay with me. Okay. All right. By the way, I love the merch. It, it looks good. Uh, Thanks. So I am curious about the, the Urban Farm podcast. I mean, you have been podcasting in some ways, even before podcasting became in our, in our awareness. And we can't go anywhere without a podcast. Yeah. So how, how did you decide... This is something I, I, I think I need to do, want to do. and Well, well going that. back to my vision in life, and I'm yeah. the person on the planet responsible for transforming our global food system, how mm -hmm. best to do that, but to touch people. Okay. Bring people cool stories. That's what the podcast is all about. Yeah. Podcast is about interview. For me, it's about interviewing cool people, doing cool stuff that inspires. Right. You know? And when those stories come back to me, like I said, I kind of hinted a little while ago, I had this uh, guy that has been listening to my podcast for five or six years. And when he retired at the age of 50, he uh, put in a 10 by 10 garden. And as he was listening to my podcast, it went to a 10 by 20 and then a 20 by 40 and then a 40 by 80 and then a 50 by 100 garden for his family. And then he heard a pod, he heard one of my episodes on the podcast about going to farmer's markets. So the fall of 2023, he started going to the farmer's markets and he was having a blast with it. Mm -hmm. And then he reached out to me and he said, Greg, I have this story and it's because of you. I want to share on your podcast. And it's like, yes, bring it on because that is the reason that I do the podcast. And because it inspires people. When you can see a guy that retires and starts a garden and starts taking it to a farmer's market and has a blast doing it, it's really fulfilling to him and they're growing healthy food, what could be better? And I'll tell you, when I went back to college, I went back to college in, late in life, I was uh, 39. One of the things that I did for my undergraduate part of my college was I used to go to the farmer's market once a week. I had this yard, this was 19... 99 when I started, I had this yard that was producing food. 
So I would go out into the yard once a week and I'd harvest what I had. I'd take it to the farmer's market and I'd sell it. And then at the end of the day, anything I had left over, I took it to Susan at the Calico Cow and gave it to her and she'd feed me lunch. And I'd walk away with three or 400 bucks for essentially a day's worth of work. That is a great small business for a retired person, a stay-at-home mom or dad, a high school student. And for me, having people be able to see that in the scope of hearing real people doing it, that's why I do what I do with the podcast. I, I love it. And and I can envision some offshoots of that in just Again, give with my my roommate and her boyfriend where they want to end up, uh, me where I want to end up. And just, I mean, the stories are just amazing. Yeah. And I really, I love the fact that you've been doing this for so long. You're, 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 you and I are around the same age, but you are a podcaster, the old guard. I mean, you've been doing no, this before. True. But I think that's pretty darn cool. And, and how, how many episodes are in your library? Um, around 850. We've been okay. doing it. I've been doing it since uh, November of 2015. Um, yeah. This time around. Okay. My first podcast was in 2007 called Freshly Green. You have to be one of in my one of my member programs in order to access that. It's not available out there anymore. Gotcha. Uh, and it was 50 episodes on how to live on how to live green on the planet. Excellent. So I am curious, what would uh, the 60 something greg peterson say to the 15 something greg peterson if he could communicate anything back into the past find out now about this notion of permaculture okay. permaculture is a method of observation and study that looks to see how we can live in agreement with the planet rather than against the planet excellent excellent Greg, it has been a pleasure to have you on the podcast. It, I have a feeling you and I could have just kept going and going and going. Yeah, exactly. But you have your things to, to, to do, and I have other things on, there you on go. my plate to do. But I hope uh, you and I get to continue to cross paths. It's been a very fascinating interview, and I really appreciate you taking the time for us. Absolutely. I got one thing left for you to ponder. Okay. I wrote this in 1996. Our downfall as a species is that we're arrogant enough to think we can control Mother Nature and stupid enough to think it's our job. <laughs> Go work with nature. Nature knows best. Figure out those systems and work in the flow of nature. I, I, I love that. And I think there was an article or some story a week or two ago about, I think it was in the Middle East somewhere, they were trying to seed the clouds oh yes and all of a sudden there's this massive flooding i have no i don't know much about it but i just remember seeing flooding in an area that's really not known for it but okay, okay. um before we head out if our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work where are the best places to go uh well we're on all the social medias and urbanfarm.org is the simplest place been there for over 20 years and there is blog post going back 20 years i love it well greg once again we're going to uh, appreciate you having you on the podcast we Thank will you. have all the backlinks to the website the anything in the news the blog as well as links to your social site uh sites and i'm just uh, really uh, appreciative that i found you or we found each other via pod match and right. uh, it's been a great interview i hope we our lives continue to cross and uh, again, if there's space in that backyard for a tiny home, we'll talk about that. But there you go. Yeah, thanks for taking the time to join us today. You bet. Thank you. I appreciate All it. Right. Perfect. Listen, stay in the line. We're going to do a real quick close and you and I can have a final chat. All right, folks. What a fantastic episode. My light bulbs are going pop, pop, pop in my head as I'm thinking, you know, all the impact of this, this topic, regenerative farming, the the just the awareness of, of of permaculture and how even in the middle of a desert life can be sprouting and good food good healthy food as 
Greg was saying, nutrient-dense food. It's available to us. All we just need to do is to do a little research and what better way than the urban farm. And Greg is truly a food system educator. And uh, if you go out to the website, urbanfarm.org, what a treasure trove of resources. And we definitely encourage you to go out there and do your research, uh, take advantage of his podcasts and, and his courses. And I think uh, you're going to have some epiphanies and perhaps you'll even be the next uh, guest on uh, Greg's show, perhaps even mine as well, as you kind of embrace this type of uh, uh, of lifestyle for yourself. Now, uh, again, we're going to provide backlinks uh, to the website and Greg's social sites. As for us, you can find this episode on our website, OutdoorAdventureSeries.com. We also have our uh, LinkedIn and Facebook pages, the Outdoor Adventure Series. This episode will be out there. The episode, as well as some shorts, will be up on YouTube. And of course, you can find us wherever you listen to your podcast, whatever directory. We are going to be there. Well, folks, I, again, I hope you enjoyed this episode with Greg Peterson. And uh, so it's uh, we are on first weekend in May, a lot of cool things happening. Uh, go out, go visit a farmer's market somewhere. I think there, many of them are starting to open up now, like Greg. Uh, farmers, I'm passionate about farmer's markets. I love it. And so go out there, have some fun, take care of yourselves, take care of your family. And uh, we look forward to having you on a future episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Take care. Everybody.